welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast series. My name is Scott Miller. I serve as your host and interviewer each week. You may know that recently for Franklin Covey, I was privileged to write a book published by HarperCollins called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, became a number one bestseller on Amazon, where I took 30 of our first 100 or so guests on this podcast, wrote a pithy, fast story about a particular transformational insight with their permission. And now I've published Master Mentors Volume 2 based on 30 additional guests, 30 new insights out in October, available now for pre-order on Amazon. And Volume 3 is in the works now on our way to the 10-volume series in Master Mentors. And who knows, maybe today's guest will be uh, willing to appear in Master Mentors Volume 3 or 4. Our guest today is the renowned entrepreneur. Some highs and some lows. He is a best-selling author of numerous books, an entrepreneur, a successful businessman, a hilarious storyteller. His name is Mike Michalowicz, and his most recent book is called Get Different. To win at marketing, don't get better, get different. Mike, welcome to On Leadership. Scott, it's a joy to be with you. Thanks for having me. What I don't like is guests that try to upstage my background, Mike, but you got a lot going on back there. Tell me about the tree. Yeah, I mean, you're beating me on raw volume for sure, but the, this tree actually came out from an experiment. When I was writing my book, uh, Get Different, I was observing uh, the tendency people have to pay attention to things that disrupt expected patterns. And I noticed all of my contemporaries, other authors, had a bookshelf with their own display, but they were common bookshelves. I want to display my books too, it's promotional, but I had to do it in a way that was different. So through some experiments, I found a bookshelf that looked like this, and I validated it was working. When I was doing webinars and so forth, I download the chat afterwards and see people saying, what's that weird bookshelf behind him? What are those books? And it's triggered a conversation. So that's how that came about. So what you're saying is I got quantity, you got quality. Uh, you got quantity for sure. I don't know if I have the perfect quality. I'm gonna keep on tweaking, playing with it. I'm actually changing the lighting. It's lit now in a different way than it was in the past to keep improving the quality. So I'm trying to get there. Uh, Mike, your, uh, your marketing prowess is not in question. Your book, Get Different, recently won the Outstanding Works of Leadership Award from BookPal. Congratulations for that. You are a prolific author. One of your seminal books around profit first, I think, is a must read for every entrepreneur, everyone who has a business side hustle. Today, I'm going to kind of bounce around some of the business insights that you share across many of your titles, including from Get Different. Would you take a few minutes, however, and kind of reorient our guests and our listeners to what is your journey? You've had some big highs and some business lows. Will you talk a bit about your history, and then we'll get into some of your current writings? Yeah, absolutely, Scott. And my history brought me to becoming an author. I never anticipated that. It wasn't part of my vision or plan for myself. But it came about and it's the best thing or best element of my life I've ever experienced. And how it came about was I started my first business right out of college, couldn't get a job, <laughs> and I uh, started my own business. Well, after a few years of grinding it out and hustling it out, finally uh, another business came in and bought it. It was a private equity deal. I never made money running the business. That's the dirty secret. But when I sold it, I made some money. Started a second company in computer crime investigation. My company was actually one of the lead investigators in the Enron trial that many folks are familiar with. Christy Brinkley's divorce, um, some of the sadly the biggest murder cases in US history where there was computer forensic evidence. We were doing the analytical work on the defense side. So we weren't the FBI or the CIA. We were representing the attorneys or working with the attorneys doing the defense for uh, Enron. So Kenneth Lay, Andrew Fasta, those folks. Well, that business, Right, right, right spot, right time, Solians. And uh, this started my downfall because I thought, Scott, I knew everything about business. I am such a genius. So I started spending money accordingly. I wanted to show off my success. And I started another business as an angel investor because I said, well, why start one business at a time? Why not start 10? I started 10 companies. All of them failed. All within about six to eight months were underwater and gone. And uh, I was also spending money so quickly on my own trophies, like the big house, more cars, the vacation home, that uh, I evaporated all my wealth within two years. And this became a turning point, a necessary but painful one for me, where I lost everything. I had to come home to my family and tell them that we were gonna lose our last house, our house, because I had no fiscal discipline. And I was sobbing and crying through this. My daughter, my, my two sons were there, my wife was there. My daughter, she was nine at the time, ran to her bedroom, 
She grabbed her piggy bank and she put it down in front of me and said, Daddy, since you can't provide for us, I'll be the family provider. And uh, it's, a, it's one of the most devastating moments of my life. If I think about it for too long, I'll, I'll start crying. But it also became the turning point for me. I realized that I didn't understand what it took to be successful. Right place, right time. Sometimes it happens magically and it happened for me. But the discipline of success, I didn't understand. So I devoted my time to studying it. And as I started writing this stuff down and documenting how to have a successful entrepreneurial journey, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm writing books. So I became an author because of that 15 years ago. And from that point forward, including today, I'm a full-time author for small business owners. Uh, Mike, thank you for the overview. In a moment, I'm gonna have you talk through what are the bad hit business habits that people need to break. There's eight of them. I think it's an extraordinary practical reminder for everybody. They'll go there in a moment. But first, before I talk about bad business habits, will you talk about what is the key insight in your recent book, Profit First? What, what is the reminder you want every business leader, entrepreneur, anybody with a side hustle to remember the principle of profit first? Yeah, it, it's, it's rooted in the concept of uh, managing our own behavior. I call them behavioral intercepts. And the point is this, it is very difficult for any person to change themselves, but it is very easy to channel ourselves. Meaning if we have a behavior, you can channel that to an outcome you want with the right system. Don't try to change yourself. Well, I noticed for most business owners, myself included, I was trying to read all those statements for my business, the income statement, the, the, you know, the, the P&L, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, and try and figure out where I stood. But my behavior was I log in my bank account and run my business off my bank balance. So Profit First is a system you set up at your bank. It's where you're naturally going. And what we do is we carve up money to its intended use before we spend it. So when money comes in, say a $1,000 deposit today, I'll take a percentage of that and put it into a savings account called Profit. I'll take a percentage of that and put it into a savings account called owner's comp. I'll take another percentage from the income account and put it into taxes and another one to operating expenses. What happens is by allocating money to its intended use before we spend it, we spend much more prudently. I used to think if I had $1,000 in my business, I could spend $1,000. That's not true. Right. Now when $1,000 comes in, I assure that I have a $200 profit, 20% profit. I make sure I'm paying myself a reasonable salary. Maybe it's $300. I'm reserving money for taxes because the tax bills are coming. And then the remainder, which maybe it's not $1,000 now, maybe it's $400, is what I truly have left to operate my business. The principle is this. Take your profit first. Allocate that money. Even hide it from yourself. Just allocate the money to the other intended uses, too. And then you'll see what's truly available to operate your business. And if you operate your business accordingly, and it is possible, you'll assure your profit because you took your profit first. I mean, Mike, it sounds like a duh, but I think it's an epiphany. In fact, it's, it's, it's now the way that I'm running my own small entrepreneurial company with employees and taxes and insurance and profit, that kind of stuff. Take it a little bit more practically. So for example, when you earn $1,000, do you take $1,000, you take, you know, say it's 10%, do you take $100 and do you automatically transfer it to a different checking account and you transfer another 100 for taxes, whatever the number is? Do you have four or five different accounts that you automatically put it in? How does that work for you? Yeah, and I like that you called it an, like a dot or epiphany. I'm, now the term epiphida applies to my, in my head. So yes, yeah, so hopefully this is an epiphida. And in the practical application, that's exactly what you do. At your primary bank, whatever bank you work with today, keep working with them. If you like them, that's great. Set up multiple accounts there. So you hop on the phone, you can do it today and set up, in the full implementation, we suggest an income account, deposits only, a profit account to pay you for taking the risk of starting a business, an owner's comp account, which is not profit. This is a pay for the work you do in your business, different than the reward for starting it. Taxes to pay your te personal tax bill and OPEX for the operations of the business. We then allocate percentages. Now it varies in, in the book, I have different percentages based upon the size of your business. But for example, we may allocate 10% toward profit, 30% toward owner's comp and so forth. And now when $1,000 comes in, I take 10% of that, $100 put in profit. I take 30% put into owner's comp. Now you see very quickly what's available for what purpose. There's a little bit more though. You also wanna hide money from yourself. So that profit, when it's accumulating at your bank, the day will come where you can't pay your bills. And then it's like, well, I can borrow from my profit account, which is the worst thing because it unwinds the system. So we gotta remove that profit so it's yeah. not accessible. Yeah. And then you start living by the rule that when you can't pay your bills, that's your business telling you, you can't afford your bills. There's something fundamentally flawed. We need higher margins, or maybe we need to reduce costs, or maybe we need to do both. But I will tell you this, 
when I tell, tell people the entire system, even though it's simple and it's an epiphata, um, it's still overwhelming. So I invite anyone who has not done it yet to do it in one step, maybe it's two. Step one is set up only one account and make a savings account and call a profit at your current bank. Step two is allocate 1%. Because if you get $1,000, I'm saying take 10 bucks. $10 is nothing. It, you can, if you can run your business off $1,000, you can run your business off $990. But $10 is something when it comes to now seeing it in a profit account, you see the money accumulating. There becomes a mental shift that kicks in. Now you'll ramp that thing up. So start slow and let it grow. Mike, your book, Profit First, is a absolute must read for anyone who has a business, starting a business, no matter how big or small. It probably will save my business, which I'm in the first year and a half of. It'll save me from some of the lessons that you've quite generously and abundantly shared around your peaks and your Thank failures you, and your recoveries. Let's pivot to, I think, what is also a very practical list. And that is this list of what you call eight business habits, eight bad business habits to break. Let me pitch one to you. And why don't you yeah. give me about a minute or two on each of these? Again, uh, epiphodas, as you call them. First is competing <laughs> competing on price. Oh, the worst thing to do. You, here's, here's an epiphoda. Do you know the strongest marketing message in the world is the price? People think, well, it's the social media. It's, it's that trifold I, I bought back in the 70s. Like that was the marketing piece. No, price determines perception. And if I, if I had a diamond and I put it on the table, Scott, and I say, hey, that's worth $5. We don't have to have a conversation. You know it's plastic. You know it's cubic zirconia. It's done. If I put that exact same diamond down and I say it's $5,000, now it's like, oh, this is the real McCoy. We got to use those little tweezer things and put in that little velvet bag thing and hide it in a safe. Perception is determined by price, and that is the biggest part of marketing. Most businesses underprice themselves. So they set themselves up to be a cheap plastic cubic zirconia. Increase your price because it increases the perceived value clients see in you and makes you help run a healthy business. That's the side bonus. Pricing is marketing, epiphoda. What would you say, Mike, to those that say, the reason to not even consider prices, you can't beat Amazon, you, you can't beat Costco, you can't beat Sam's, you can't beat anyone that's got multiple buying power. You've actually got to compete on service. You got to compete on selection, you got to compete on, on some other value. Talk about the value of maybe not even focusing on price. Oh yeah, well you can beat uh, Amazon, you can beat these businesses for about a day or two before you go under because they're in such a high volume game that you're not gonna have the cost benefits on your side. And sadly, I'm not saying that as a joker to be quippy, that's what most businesses do. They say, I am gonna compete on price. I'm gonna be the highest benefit to my clients, highest value and the lowest price. And that's not sustainable. Right. So people do choose to and they get crushed. What is sustainable is value-based. Value-based is where you offer something that is transformative for your clients. Realize the Amazons in the world are in business for transactions, high volume transactions. We wanna be in low volume transformations. Transformation which the client says, this experience was so valuable, it served me in an extraordinary way. You don't have to be better in all capacities, but in some unique transformative capacity. Maybe you're more intimate with your customer. Maybe you can anticipate the challenges and problems they have. Charge a lot for that because you're saving their lives in some capacity. But maybe your solution is more thorough. Maybe your solution brings a result today as opposed to waiting a month through other solutions. Figure out what your great advantage is and then inflate the price significantly because when the client invests in that, they are vested also in the outcome. They're more likely to see the value in it and be active in participating in bringing that value to themselves. Eight bad business habits to break from Mike Malowick, not, uh, Michalowicz. The no, first one is name, competing. You, you nailed it, it is pronounced Malow, Michalow, Malowicz. That is the name. You know, <laughs> you could have given me that Ukrainian one. Ukrainian name, did I you, tell you that? You could have given me that one, right? I could. Uh, I could. Know, know your guest I last. Purple nurple. <laughs> know your guest pronunciation of my producers are dying right now. Michalowicz. Uh, eight business habits, bad habits to break. Number one, competing on price. Number two is trying to appeal to everyone. Our our, our guest and my friend Seth Godin talks about not the total addressable market, but instead the smallest viable market. You have a similar thought. Talk about the risks of trying to appeal to everyone. My book is for everyone. Everyone needs my manicure business. What's the risk? Yeah, so you have to water down your messaging, you have to water down your services, and you have to keep diversifying what you do because not everyone has the exact same needs. There's modifications uh, in, in what their needs are. So say you serve, uh, say you're a funeral home. I'm picking something very random here. 
and you'd say, I serve anyone in the community. Well, you may have someone that's Muslim or someone that's Christian or someone that's Jewish. And you know, there's probably different procedures and protocols in the process. And now you have to learn all these things and you can't be excellent. But say you just serve the Jewish community. Now you can understand the intricacies of what their service needs are and really cater to them. Well, what happens? Now your reputation explodes. You get me, and because you get me, I will tell everyone around me. There's a saying, birds of a feather flock together. When you have a reputation of excellence in the community, those birds started talking about you. But if you diversify and serve everybody, you're kind of meh for everybody, and you're not worthy of conversation. Mike, if I'm not mistaken, in your book, Get Different, you share a story about an entrepreneur, I think was an accountant, and he had a passion for cigars. And it seems oh, like it's yeah. a good time to tell that story. Yeah, his name is Gabriel Pina, and uh, he loves cigars. He's an accountant. That's his own personal interest. And instead of saying, I'm an accountant for everybody, he went for cigar shops. Now, think about if you're a cigar shop owner, how often does an accountant approach you and say, I understand the cigar business. I understand how it's manufactured. I understand importing. I understand the shelf life of cigars, which I didn't even realize they have a shelf life. And the, compared to his contemporaries who said, I can do the accounting for anybody. Gabriel spoke their language. The instant transfer of trust happens when people say, oh, you know the code words to our community, which is their unique language. So he won their trust. And he's able to dictate a significant premium because he was a specialist. Now, here's the funny thing. A specialist doesn't mean he's 100% different than his competition. In fact, I would say he was 95, 96% the same. The fundamentals we did is the same as everyone else. But because he understood that community, he was able to introduce insights, thoughts, and even, even proactively identify problems for them before they knew they had them. So Gabriel did very well and continues to do very well for that community because he gets them. But I think you mentioned in the book that his business was floundering. And as soon as he began Fire. to cater to cigar shops, he actually had, with I think you said, six figures of billable income in a matter of months. Oh, it was, it was remarkable. Because think, you know, think about any community, it's, it's incestuous. We, we talk to each other. You know, I, I know a lot of other authors. And when an insight comes up, I'm talking with my author buddies and, and things go around very quickly. Gabriel was trying to get that one, you know, uh, car wash facility. And then he was trying to get the one small retail store. They, they don't ever hang out together. Once he got in with one cigar shop and wow, this person, and he started calling it another cigar shop, that cigar shop said, oh my gosh, the guy you're currently serving was talking about you. I'm so happy you're calling me now. Because it's incestuous, because they talk amongst each other, from their perception, he's everywhere because he's concentrating where they concentrate or they hang out. Mike, you mentioned birds of a feather. You know authors. Have you ever met another author that actually has also won an Outstanding Works of Literature Award from BookPal? There's a guy named Scott. Oh, Irwin. shucks. Go on. This guy, okay. dude, this guy is a stud. Number. A stud. He's actually been, he's been nominated twice. He, he won once the first time. The second one, some jerk took it from him. He, that guy doesn't deserve the guy who got it. I'm just <laughs> saying that. Number, I met my match, people. He's my twin. I never knew my background was Ukrainian. Your doppelganger. Uh, Your bearded doppelganger. <laughs> I just hope that my son does not bring his piggy back out. Because piggy back, piggy, piggy bank <laughs> out. Because I can appreciate the pain you experienced yeah. with your daughter. Uh, number three, working around the clock. Okay, so th this one really riles me up. I am so tired, Scott, of hearing about hustle and grind and that that's entrepreneurial success. It is the antithesis of what entrepreneurship is. Look at the definition in the Webster Dictionary or whatever. Entrepreneurship is about having a vision and then organizing resources, people around that plan to get to that vision. That's what entrepreneurship is. The number one job of an entrepreneur is to create jobs, not do the job. Now, here's the thing. When we start out, you're probably the only resource you can afford because your time is probably free. So in the beginning, you must do the work, but as quickly as possible, we as entrepreneurs must extract ourselves, provide the job opportunities, either in a fractional space, a few hours here, a few hours there, ultimately maybe in full-time space for employees to get us that vision. Then our job is to be the great choreographer. Keep organizing resources to get that vision done. Don't work your butt off work your mind very intelligently to organize people to get us to that vision. No more of that working through the night, no more hustle and grind. You know, we've interviewed a few hundred uh, 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 very successful entrepreneurs here. Recently, Grant Cardone, of course, you know, with the 10X rule, and he talks about the 10X rule being, you basically have to outwork your competition 
10 times more to hustle and grind. And you're saying, you're saying. Bull. I'm you saying disagree. that's bull. There you go. And now listen, I want to position this. We look at people like at Grant Cardone or whatever and say, wow, look at how successful they are. Clearly he knows the formula. Well, I would argue he and I know the formulas that work for ourselves. But what I've seen in the aggregate is the most successful people are the most calculated people, not the hardest working. They're, listen, Jeff Bezos right now is not packaging up my uh, Amazon shipment. He could be, that's hustle and grind. No, he's working at the highest levels of strategic negotiation. He works hard, smart. I'm not saying he works ridiculously. What a small uh, business owner typically does is they say, oh, that means I must do everything. No, no, no. Do the things you're capable of, but the most capable or most important function is the organizing of others. So what maybe Grant Cardone's doing, I don't know his business, but I suspect maybe the majority of his work is organizing others. Maybe he's a spokesperson for his brand. I'd be surprised if he's packaging up the packages on the front line at Amazon. I think not. Eight bad business habits to break. Number four, being buddies with your employees. Yeah, but listen, it's good to be friendly with people and it's great and important to be nice. But the problem is when friends take over the responsibility to the health of the business. I've seen business owners and I've been the business owner that says, my relationship with this per person is more important than the health of the business. And even though they're not performing and serving the business, even though they're causing the business to collapse, I'd rather retain them and have the whole business collapse and my other 15 people or 20 or whoever it is to lose their jobs because of this relationship. Well, that, that's crazy, yet that's how he's behaving. What we need to do is focus on the health of the entirety. Don't allow one person to sink the ship. We must save the ship, that's our responsibility. And passengers will come on and passengers will come off. Definitely have a rapport, definitely have a friend relationship, be supportive of these people, but we all have a common goal of supporting and moving this business forward. That's priority number one. You know, several years ago, Rachel Hollis, the famous author and entrepreneur and blogger, podcaster, invited me down to speak to her team in Dallas, Texas, in Austin, Texas, about 75 yeah. people. And I was there to speak on my book, The Owl Award winner, Management Mess to Congratulations, Leadership Success. Congratulations, I just thank, heard. Thank you very much. And it was interesting when she sat down with this team in sort of an old converted church house and there was great culture and camaraderie, she did something jarring. She said, in my presence, to all of her team, I'm not your friend. You are not my friend. I am the leader of this business. And at the moment, I kind of like, you could hear a pin drop. I kind of thought, well, that was harsh. Now, since then, she's gone on to some other challenges that may or may not have been related to her leadership style. That's probably debatable. But I remember thinking, you know, maybe that message could have been delivered more softly, but, but intuitively, she was right. She was not their friend. She was the owner. She was the entrepreneur, and they worked there in the business that she owned. Yeah, I, I think there's raw truth there. Maybe I would have used different words too, but I, I like the position that we're of service here. So uh, I may I'll try it. This is risky, I'm gonna move my camera here. But I have a, my life's purpose is right here on the wall to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. When I start my business meetings every day, we do a quick huddle. We have a reminder, we are here on a mission to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. This is why we're here. We, we are colleagues in supporting and making that happen and everyone must make their best effort. So we have a common goal, but I don't start off by saying, hey, let's have a kumbaya and hang out and how, how do we all just like each other? Because that's important in, in, in the experience of life itself and friendships, but it won't move us toward that goal. So I start off with what our vision is, the company vision, if you're, if you're on board, let's do this. And if it's time for you to leave uh, and, and pursue something else, that's fine too. So I, I lead with purpose and mission and that we're on this common march toward it. I, I definitely don't lead with friendship, but it wouldn't be my style to say we're not friends. Friendships come out of it, that's truly true. Yeah, well said. Uh, I'm a big fan of Rachel Hollis, by the way, in the totality of what she's done in her business and helping millions of others around the, the world. Uh, number five. She also won an OWL award, I heard. I don't think so, actually. And you don't like her no. anymore. I was just seeing if you, that was why yeah, it was I a test. I don't think so, yeah. That was a test. Uh, that's a small world of prestigious authors. Number five. You're the two OWLs. <laughs> number five, do-it-yourself marketing. Yeah, so do-it-yourself marketing um, is risky because we usually replicate the other, it's another way of saying it, it's replicate the other people's marketing marketing. So what happens in do-it-yourself marketing is I see people go to uh, their contemporaries, their, their industry competitors, and say, what's the best practices? And they respond by saying, well, an email blast always works for me, or Facebooks, or mailing out postcards. What I find is 
there's like usually four, maybe five kind of circuitous conversations around the exact same form of marketing. I, I was at an event with photographers. There was 3,000 people in the room. And uh, during it, I was asked the survey, I said, by a show of hands, who does you know, email marketing? Most of the hands go up. At, at the end of this little survey, there was five common practices that everyone used. The, the sixth one about one person used. That's the craziness, is do-yourself marketing is usually copycat marketing, and it's by definition invisible. It's white noise. People don't see it. What we need to do is break out of that pattern. We need to do something that no one else does. And uh, usually the best way to do it is to find the marketing outside your industry that's working for someone else and then steal it, R&D, rip off and duplicate, and bring it into your industry. So don't just do it yourself by copying. Look from the outside, maybe get professional guidance, but surely don't do what everyone else is doing in your industry because that's invisible. Number six, perpetually pivoting. Oh my God, this was popularized by some pundits uh, of the idea of, of changing your business. And, and pivot is good, but it's been taken too far. So here's the definition of pivot. You offer something to your customer, the customer's not buying it. Change the offering until they buy it. And you made the change it multiple times to ensure that you finally get traction in that space, which sounds great, but there's one part missing. What about you, the owner of this business? Do you like what you're doing now? You started off selling A, but now you're selling X, and do you like X? And many business owners that I've met have pivoted themselves into something that they loathe. They say, I just don't like this, what I'm doing. I hate what I do, but it makes money. Well, that's the definition of prostitution, by the way, just between me and you there. So what I tell business owners is don't pivot a line. Yes, you have to adjust to what the customer wants, otherwise it won't be viable. And you must align with what your heart calls out to do. But don't pivot, align. I think there's too many chefs that are calling out what their heart wants them to do because I can't tell you how many times I've frequented a restaurant, right, with my wife and perhaps another couple, and we always order the gnocchi. I'm making that up. I don't love gnocchi, but you get the point. And then all of a sudden, after three years, the gnocchi's off the menu. And we'll ask the server, where's the gnocchi? Ah, oh, the chef didn't want to make that anymore. Well, I can't imagine we're the only people who came here because the gnocchi was so yeah. good. I'm guessing there are times perhaps when owners or chefs get bored, but yet the customer wasn't bored. What's the balance there? Yeah, that's a great point. That, that's the opposite of pivoting to the customer. Now you're adjusting to yourself. I knew a business, I actually, I, I uh, was on a television show critiquing this business. They made a thing called a light glove. It was a mouse for your hand. And this was back 10 years ago. And uh, the owner's like, this is the next big thing. He was all in on it and they invested hundreds of thousands of dollars, but there was no traction in the market and he couldn't get over it. He had indebted himself. He had lost his house over this. So, because your heart calls out to do it alone isn't enough. It must be a match. And the simple thing is, if you're gonna make a change, measure that change. If I dump the gnocchi, first let's figure out how much gnocchi are we selling? And when we stop doing this, what's the cost? When we have empirical data in front of us, it becomes hard to argue. So don't just do everything off the gut. Look at the empirical data. If your heart wants to make a change, you're gonna see if that was a costly mistake or not, and then you can unwind it. Okay, Mike, this is extraordinarily helpful. Let's land the plane. Number seven, taking customers for granted. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, I shouldn't say of course, but many of us do. Many of us think a customer is a transaction, but there is a relationship there. They are measuring what we're doing, but they also don't measure everything. So we think, you know, once I deliver my service or product, the, the client should be happy. And if I don't hear anything, they are. And, and then we move on to the next one. But the customer is actually monitoring certain things about us and they are gauging us on those steps throughout. And uh, you may have a great experience or they may have a great experience with you 80% of the way, but at the very end, you tail off or you fade away. And now a great experience goes awry. And that, that's not a good thing. They go on, uh, on review engines and, and criticize you. They may never do business with you again, which is kind of the, the quack, silent killer in many businesses. They just disappear. So there's a hack here or a trick. What you do is go to your clients and ask them as you build this relationship, hey, of all the things we're doing here, what are we doing right? Now, this is a Jedi mind trick because when your customer tells you what you're doing right, they won't do what you're doing right. They tell you how they judge you. As an example, I had a computer service business. I was selling to hedge funds. I asked my hedge fund manager, I said, what are we doing right? He says, your response times. Well, what I realized when he said my response times, we respond quickly to issues is what we're doing right. I realized that's the one thing he's observing most about me. Ironically, the thing you do right is the thing you need to amplify. So I started to respond quicker. I dispatched my technicians in a more efficient manner. 
Within a few weeks, I get a call from the owner, his name is Larry. And he says, this is unbelievable. Your services have improved radically. You're already great and now it's off the charts. What are you doing? Well, I, I'm doing what he told me. When your customer says this is the thing you're doing right, that's the thing you need to amplify. Don't discount that, amplify. Mike, lastly, you say hiring the wrong people. It sounds simplistic, but I'm sure there's more behind that. Expand on that. Yeah. Yeah, because we hire friends, we hire people we like. I like you, the interview was great. We spent you know an hour together, clearly we should get married. I mean, we make these big mistakes. I think what we need to do is hire people not on the skills, that resume, uh, because that's the one thing we can give them. I think what we need to do is evaluate people on first, their energy and enthusiasm. Do they have the energy we need to drive the job responsibility forward? Are they enthusiastic about our company? Are they a cultural fit? Do they have the intelligence? These are all things, I can't give you intelligence, even though apparently you have a lot because you're an owl winner, just wanna point that out. Damn I can't give you your energy. I can't give you any of those elements. Those are the intangibles. Most of us hire on skills. And as a result, we're getting the wrong people. Hire on the intangibles and give them the one thing that you can give them, which is the skills. Mike, in your experience, you've, 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 you are a prolific author, consultant, coach, you have programs, you've hosted a TV program, I think on, was it MSNBC, is that right? Yes. Yeah, uh, you've, you know, you've been an entrepreneur advisor for decades. What are some of the biggest, what are some of the smallest mistakes with the biggest negative return that business leaders make? Meaning like the small trim tab adjustments that could have the biggest positive improvement on their business. Yeah, okay, so the, the smallest one is not looking at the numbers, but looking at the guts, their gut. It's unbelievable how many business owners do this. And I did it for years and was so frustrated. In the very beginning of a business, gut is all you got. There is no history, there is no numbers to look at. So the first year you're kind of shooting from the hip and you're making some progress. But then by the second or third year in business, I'm still trusting my gut and I'm ignoring the numbers. Simply evaluating your numbers and getting empirical data around what decisions you're making and the impact it's having is a game changer. And yet most business owners ignore that. It takes barely any time. You can have your accountant prepare this or just have a, 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 one, a, a contractor run some numbers for you and prepare a spreadsheet. And then when you run your business by numbers, it's kind of like paint by numbers, you'd make the right moves, you put the right colors in the right spot. When, when you're measuring your business and running it by numbers, you can make the right moves so much more fast and appropriately than you can just by trusting your gut. Mike, I don't usually have our guests pitch their businesses, but if I'm not mistaken, you have either an online course or a work session where entrepreneurs and business owners, business unit leaders can actually work on their profit first. Talk about that. Well, thank you. So we have an organization called Profit First Professionals. After I wrote the book, there was a, a, an epiphany that I should have uh, accountants, bookkeepers, maybe even business coaches certified in this. So we have a site called Profit First Professionals. We have over 600 certified professionals that can help businesses in any industry, any vertical. And so you can go to profitfirstprofessionals.com, click on the menu option, and we can find you a PFP to help you out. When most people win the Super Bowl, they say they're going to Disney World. You've won an owl now, the penultimate award in our industry next to the Pulitzer soon to probably eclipse the Pulitzer. Uh, what's next for you? What books, what, 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 um, what gift do you plan to give to entrepreneurs to avoid poverty next? Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the Super Bowl heroes are going to Disney. I'm going to Amish territory from here in New Jersey. It's a little further west. But calmer, to celebrate. calmer. And there the I'm second happiest place in the world. This, <laughs> it is, it is. And uh, I'm gonna raise a farm. And then I'm going to, um, <laughs> I'm going to write a book called All In, and All In is the working title, but right now I'm studying what gets employees engaged, what gets an employee acting like an owner. I think I, I think I found the solution. We're testing in our own companies here, and we're codifying this system, and it should be out in the next year and a half or two. Mike Michalowicz, your energy is contagious. Your positivity is inspiring. Thank you for your abundance. Joy having you on the program today. Action-packed advice for leaders, business owners, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, or perhaps for those who are just thinking about some kind of future business. Thanks for pouring into our listeners and viewers around the world today, Mike. Great having you this here. This has been so much fun, Scott. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you back here next week for a new guest on leadership. Mm -hmm.